Welcome to this episode of Monday Morning Joe. I'm Dr. Andrew Kirkendall from Moffitt Cancer Center. Monday Morning Joe is a quick-hitting, coffee-talk-style five-episode series on the latest and greatest in advanced systemic mastocytosis with associated myeloid neoplasms. Please remember to subscribe to the Exchange CME YouTube channel and make sure notifications are turned on to be prompted when new episodes are released. Today we're going to discuss the diagnosis of SMAHN, or associated myeloid neoplasm, and some of the related challenges. So now we have a couple of different uh, diagnostic criteria. It's always worth kind of comparing the two given the, the fact that they have some slight differences. So when we look at the WHO and the ICC diagnostic criteria, uh, I will say that as far as diagnosing SMHN, they are largely the same. We do know that, that within these diagnostic criteria, there's some slight differences in terminology. One being that, that there's a focus on, on associated myeloid neoplasms as, as opposed to uh, associated hematologic neoplasms. That may be a slight difference, but really is not too functionally different than our previous diagnosis. When we think about what it takes to diagnose systemic mastocytosis with an associated hematologic neoplasm, We'd first start on diagnosing systemic mastocytosis. This is often done with a bone marrow biopsy, exhibiting uh, aberrant uh, mast cell production and proliferation. Frequently, stains are performed to identify mast cells using a, a, a kit stain or a CD117 stain or a tryptase stain. And then concurrently, we want to show aberrant expression of CD25 and or CD2 that shows that these are abnormal and clonal mast cells that are being proliferated. The advent of kit mutation testing allows us to document a driver mutation, which really supports this diagnosis. And certainly, you want to rule out other potential diagnoses as well. Then once you have a diagnosis of systemic mastocytosis, then you go down the algorithm of finding out whether or not this is indolent or advanced. And within the category of advanced, you're often looking for the potential of an associated associated hematologic neoplasm, often a myeloid neoplasm, specifically things like myelodysplastic syndrome, CMML, uh, or a myeloproliferative neoplasm. It's interesting to note that the associated hematologic neoplasm may be diagnosed concurrently with the mastocytosis. It may be diagnosed before or actually may uh, be diagnosed after mastocytosis. Now, when we look at the international consensus classification, again, this diagnosis is very similar to what we see with the WHO criteria as far as diagnosing mastocytosis. Now, the, the one thing we'll say when we talk about SMAMN, now associated myeloid neoplasm, as I alluded to earlier, we really were requiring the associated hematologic neoplasm here to be myeloid at origin because that's where we understand that that is prognostic significance. So what testing should be done when systemic mastocytosis with an associated hematologic neoplasm is suspected? We've touched on a few of them already. We certainly want to do lab tests to evaluate blood counts. We want to check a serum tryptase to evaluate mast cell burden. We're also doing bone marrow biopsies and looking at either uh, staining as well as flow cytometry to assess for aberrant expression or of CD25, CD2, occasionally CD30 as well. Often we're, we're overlaying these stains up upon a mast cell marker such as CD117 or tryptase to make sure it is those abnormal mast cells that are expressing those aberrant markers. And it's really important that we're testing for kit mutations. And so again, this is a driver mutation that is really uh, present in most, virtually all cases of a systemic mastocytosis that have this uh, kit mutation. And so uh, this is something that's, that's quite important to one, just establish a diagnosis, but also it may be something that identifies potential therapeutic options. Oftentimes, let's say that the associated hematologic neoplasm is the first thing that's diagnosed. Uh, oftentimes, a kit mutation may be the thing that triggers further investigation for the presence of systemic mastocytosis. Many times, the associated hematologic neoplasm, especially in the setting of an aggressive associated hematologic neoplasm like an acute myeloid leukemia, may actually cloud the ability to assess for aberrant mast cells and abnormal mast cell production. Therefore, a kit mutation done on some sort of gene sequencing or next generation sequencing panel may trigger the pathologist to go back in and look for the presence of these aberrant mast cell uh, proliferation. When you find a kit mutation, this could be predictive of the disease, but also open up options as far as treatment goes. So what about some challenges with finding this kit mutation? Well, I mentioned that, that oftentimes we're finding this with next generation sequencing, and that does happen, right? When we're looking at a, an associated hematologic neoplasm, sometimes we come across this kit mutation, but we also understand that, that there are limitations to this. NGS panels often have sensitivities around 2% to 5%, and we know these kit mutations can occur at very low variant allele fractions, somewhere between 1%, maybe even lower than that. And so really highly sensitive kit mutation testing is needed, such as dig digital droplet PCR, uh, to be able to identify some of these lower level kit mutations. 
What about other diagnostic markers? Well, we always want to know the burden or the amount of mast cells within the bone marrow, so we're always establishing the percentage of mast cells in the bone marrow on the core biopsy as well as on the aspirate where mast cells are less frequently found. We're assessing tryptase levels. Normal levels of tryptase are usually less than 11, but levels above 20 seem to identify our, our diagnostic criteria that would identify the potential for mastocytosis. This level of tryptase can sometimes be helpful as if it goes over 200, this would be indicative of a, of a B finding. And then we're also identifying different markers of aberrant uh, uh, mast cell markers, such as CD25, which is the most common, but also we look at CD2 and sometimes CD30. Now, serum tryptase is the most sensitive among, among the uh, immunohistochemical markers for systemic mastocytosis. This stains on virtually all mast cells, regardless of their stage of maturation, activation status, or tissue location. And the levels do widely vary, uh, with a significantly greater proportion of aggressive SM and SMH in patients, including markedly elevated tryptase, indicative of a higher mast cell burden, compared to those patients with indolent SM, which may have less marked uh, tryptase elevations. Tryptase is also elevated in a significant proportion of, of patients that have associated hematologic neoplasm. It can just be elevated in the presence of AML, MDS, CMML, and thus it is a little bit less sensitive for identifying mastocytosis in patients that have an associated hematologic neoplasm. Neither tryptase nor CD117 staining distinguish between normal and neoplastic mast cells, so that's important to remember. CD25, uh, detected by IHC, uh, really identifies aberrant mast cell production, and this is a reliable diagnostic tool because it detects abnormal mast cells in all SM subtypes. Neoplastic mast cells typically express CD25 and or CD2, as I mentioned. Importantly, in addition to these staining, we'll look at the morphology of the mast cells and we'll commonly identify these mast cells as being spindle-shaped in nature. In some cases, we can have no more normal mast cells, uh, and those are often uh, found to be CD25 negative. So what are some diagnostic challenges? I, I think we've, we've touched on the fact that diagnostic delays are very possible for a number of reasons. One, patients present with very vague and easily, uh, or uh, symptoms that could be easily attributed to other disease states. The symptoms are quite broad as well, and uh, this is really a rare diagnosis that many physicians are unfamiliar and uncomfortable with. Numerous organ systems can be affected, uh, so patients can present with you know, predominant skin symptoms or no skin symptoms, predominant GI symptoms or no GI symptoms, frequent anaphylaxis, which doesn't always trigger someone to think about a hematologic disease. And oftentimes these patients could actually get diagnosed with something else first, something else that's quite serious, another myeloid neoplasm that may take all the attention and, uh, directed at it and, and, and one might not even notice or, or pay attention to the, the underlying systemic mastocytosis that may also be present. So what are some take home points here? I would say a diagnosis of mastocytosis relies on bone marrow biopsy. Uh, oftentimes, or at least a biopsy of an extracutaneous organ that shows mast cell proliferation in a non-skin organ. Again, bone marrow is the most common area that's bio biopsy, but oftentimes a GI biopsy could work as well. Detection of acute mutation and elevated tryptase help to support this diagnosis. And atypical mast cells are identified by staining for CD25, as well as often CD2 and sometimes CD30. Thank you for joining me today. As discussed earlier, please check back for new episodes on the Exchange CME YouTube page. Clinicians, nurses, and pharmacists can also visit exchangecme.com for free access to CME in a variety of therapeutic areas. Thanks again. We'll see you on the next episode of Monday Morning Joe.